listening to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your host, Joey and Kelly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show right here on 860 AM WNLV and W293CX106.5. Megan Kane is a creative vegetable gardener in Madison. She is passionate about teaching others to be successful gardeners. She does this through her books and presentations. She's also extremely passionate about getting the whole community into gardening. Welcome to the program, Megan. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, we want to. I'll just jump right in. We had a caller right before you came on and asked about the ways to detour squirrels from destroying their plants in their garden. Every time they plant something, they the squirrels come in and just have a heyday with it. Uh, we recommended uh, Bob X animal repellent as well as chili powder. Uh, do you have any surefire ways besides getting rid of them by killing them to uh, get them <laughs> out of your garden? Sure, yeah. I've noticed that they're particularly active in my garden this time of year. I think they're burying lots of uh, nuts and things. So I've noticed that I use a lot of mulch, and I've noticed that they, a lot of the mulch has been disturbed. Um, I would recommend, one thing I've had luck with is using row cover. Okay. So it's a light white fabric um, that I have used to keep rabbits out and squirrels. Um, and I would suggest that, especially I, my experience is sometimes squirrels once things are bigger they don't really bother them so i don't know if they're having particularly having problems with things that are young and maybe they're digging up um, but row cover sometimes can get thing help get things through that really young stage so that once the plants get older my experience is sometimes the rabbits and the squirrels don't bother them as much okay. so that would be my suggestion definitely so you garden in the front yard in your madison home Many cities have restrictions against this. How do you make that work? Yeah, I do. So we, um, when we bought our house, you could not see the house from the street. It was so overgrown with lots of shrubs, weedy shrubs, and other things. Um, and the, but we realized that that was one of the sunniest parts of the property. So we we removed all the overgrowth, and then all of a sudden, you could see our house. Um, our neighbors were certainly surprised all of a sudden that, that they could see that there was a house there. Um, so we, well, one thing that we did, we knew that we wanted to have a front yard garden, uh, and we purposely picked a neighborhood that we knew wouldn't be a big deal if we had a front yard garden. So certainly there are more manicured neighborhoods in Madison than where we live. So um, that's one thing that we looked into we'll pick a neighborhood where we knew we didn't have to have a perfectly manicured yard because we never do i like to call ours a working yard uh we chop firewood and we grow food and we just have a lot of stuff going on in our yard so uh that that's one thing that we did but for madison they're often more concerned about sight lines so if you are growing really tall things so once in a while people that have prairie gardens maybe between their house and the street or near the curb um, if there's cars that can't see, so maybe if you have a garden that's right next to a driveway and people are pulling out and they can't see, um, that's often what Madison is concerned about. Uh, I think they often also kind of run on neighborhood complaints. So if you have neighbors that are complaining about your yard, then the city's going to come out and talk to you. But if, in general, if your neighborhood's okay with it, it seems like they leave you alone. Okay. Uh, you developed one of the first youth garden programs in Madison. For, for our listeners, uh, for, for some of them who, um, who might want to think about doing a community garden, and, and we always encourage that, what was some of the challenges that you faced and some, advi some advice you can give people who want to do something similar, whether in Milwaukee or wherever they're listening throughout the country? Sure. So it's true that so, so some youth gardens are attached to schools, some youth gardens, the one that where I worked, um, it was actually part of a community garden land. It was really land trust that was run by a nonprofit, and there was a big community garden there and then a separate kids garden. Um, so I think first is kind of decide do you, who, what youth do you want to serve? Are you going to serve, do you want to be attached to a school where the students come out during the school day? Uh, and then um, work in the garden and it, the teachers can integrate some of the gardening stuff into their curriculum? Or do you want to have a kid's garden at a maybe a community center and then the kids that come to the community center are going to come out into the garden? Do you want it to be a part of a community garden where maybe 
the kids of families that come to the community garden can also access the kids' garden. So I think that's the first step is kind of become clear on on what kids you want to serve and get involved. Um, you can also get kids involved in your own front yard or side yard or backyard garden. I have a, my next door neighbor is six years old, just turned seven, and we've become good friends. Uh, because of her interest in my garden. So now she works with me for the first year. This year she has her own garden bed, and she decided what she wanted to plant in there. So you can also do it a little bit more informally and just get some of the kids in your neighborhood involved in your garden by inviting them to be a part of it, um, and you can uh, teach kids that way. So so one of the chal- I think a big challenge of school gardens especially is that the kids aren't there during the height of the gardening season, which is the summer. And so a lot of schools have trouble finding people to um, take care of the garden when school's not in session. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Are there kids? Are there going to be kids around all year round? Um, and if not, what's your plan to take care of the garden in those off times when the kids aren't present? Definitely makes sense. So you like to preserve, preserve food without canning. Why don't you like canning? And what are some ways to preserve your food without canning? Yeah, so I my, my first experience with gardening, actually, and food preserving was when I went and I was an intern at a farm, uh, and I had never gardened before. I didn't know anyone that gardened. I didn't do any food preserving, um, and the way that I learned to food preserve was canning, and then I left there, eventually moved to Madison, had my own garden, kept doing doing lots of canning and I realized that I personally didn't really like it that much. (laughs) Um, For me, I feel like it takes a lot of time and you have to have a critical mass of vegetables often to make it worth it. Um, A lot of times I felt like my my kitchen was extremely messy at the end of a long canning session and then you have to do a lot of cleanup. So I started to look for some other ways that I could preserve food. Um, And the methods that I like to use uh, are really fresh fridge and freezer. So if at all possible, I store food fresh in my basement. So that would be things like onions and garlic and winter squash and sweet potatoes. Um, So then they don't need any processing at all, usually just some drying and curing. I just put four crates of of onions down in my basement yesterday to get, get ready for fall and winter. And then I also use my fridge. So there's a few things like carrots and beets that can store really well in your fridge for many, many months. So I usually grow a fall crop of beets and carrots. I have both of those in my garden right now. I leave them in the garden as long as possible. Uh, But then before the ground freezes, I dig them up, and then I store them in my fridge all winter long. We've often still been eating stored beets and carrots into April and May of the following year. Uh, And then the third method I use is a chest freezer. So I like to freeze a lot of different things. Um, there's some things like peppers that don't need any processing. You could, you don't have to steam them or blanch them or anything. You can just freeze them raw, just chop them up, remove the seeds, throw them in some freezer containers and throw them in the freezer. Uh, and then there's some other things like broccoli that benefit for from a little bit of steaming or blanching before you put them in the freezer. But I find that's a pretty easy and quick way to to preserve a lot of vegetables and you don't really need a large quantity if you end up with a few extra peppers you can just chop them up throw them in a bag and then put them in your freezer so those are my three preferred methods we do do um one canning session a year where we can our own salsa because we really like to have that on hand throughout the winter and spring all right uh we live in similar climates or zim- similar zones milwaukee and madison what are some challenging vegetables that you have found that uh, you've had difficulty growing in your zone and how have you overcome it or have you overcome those challenges with those difficult vegetables well i think sometimes the difficulty depends on the year so i grow a lot of sweet peppers i love growing red peppers and yellow peppers and orange peppers um, and usually I have no problem. It's really successful. But this year I got some kind of bacterial infection and I had to rip up 35 pepper plants, which was very painful. Um, so some of it is year to year. Maybe there's a particular pest that's, that's more um, prolific on one year or I happen to get a disease that I never got before. So sometimes it just depends year to year. Overall, um, I would say I struggle with Brussels sprouts. Um, right now, all my the actual Brussels sprouts are so tiny. I usually, in the la- actually last year, I tried to chop off the top of the plant to, to just 
to have it stop growing and then focus on creating bigger Brussels sprouts. And that seemed to work pretty well. So I did that again this year. Um, let's see. Other things I have. Well, I would say there's things I don't grow because they're too, I find them to be too difficult or too much, um, I don't know, they need too much special attention. Melons is one of those things. A lot of the growers in my area use black plastic to grow melons, so and they take up a lot of room, so I decided I'm not going to grow them in my garden. I'll just buy them from the farmer's market. Um, let's see. Winter squash I don't usually grow because uh, the same thing, it takes up a lot of room. Um, I was just looking at, I have grown sweet potatoes the last couple of years, which I've had good success with, but I haven't had the best success with trying to cure them because they like to be cured at very high temperatures, around 90 degrees. And by the time I harvest my sweet potatoes, which is around this time of year, uh, this year being the exception, exception where it is 85 degrees today, we usually don't have those high temperatures. And so I'm, I, I'm about to harvest my sweet potatoes again. I'm trying to figure out, okay, how can I create those conditions so that I cure them properly? Because last year I didn't really do that, and I lost a lot of sweet potatoes because I didn't cure them properly. So... Um, so yeah, those are kind of the ones that I struggle with, but I, I like to remind gardeners that even when you've been gardening a long time and you know a lot about gardening, there's still years where things happen and you don't know why and you do everything the way you did it the following year and you had success. And there's a certain amount of mystery in gardening, which I think keeps it exciting, but can also be frustrating for newer gardeners who I think often blame themselves and not knowing that sometimes things just happen in the garden and you're not even sure why. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us about your books and where to find you? Sure. So, uh, my business is The Creative Vegetable Gardener, so people can find me at creativevegetablegardener.com. I have a blog. You can sign up for my email list. I usually send out one email a week on Sunday mornings uh, with a timely gardening topic. Um, and then my I have written two books, one about easy food preserving, um, which you can also find on my website, and it's also on Amazon. And then I wrote another book this, that just came out this past winter on garden planning. It's called Smart Start Garden Planning. I, I've learned over the years that the most successful gardeners are really people that have some sort of plan and idea of what they're going to do for the season. So it's kind of walking people through the process of figuring out what you want to grow and evaluating different vegetables to see if they're worth it to grow in your garden and where how to order seeds and varieties that I recommend. So that was a fun one to write and try and encourage people to don't wait until the first nice day in spring to start thinking about your gardening. Really just try to come up with even just a really simple plan before the season begins. So both of those can be found on my website and then also on Amazon as well. Well, Megan, I greatly, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to join Holly, myself, and our listeners and sharing some of your garden wisdom with all of us. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be back. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Megan. If you're in the Milwaukee or surrounding areas, just tune your radio to 860 AM or FM 106.5. You can also find links on our Facebook pages, The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener and Home Canning. Our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, click on the radio tab at the top of the page, then click on the Listen Live button, and you'll have immediately access to our live program. Mobile devices work very well. Also, go to your app store and download for free the TuneIn app or the Simple Radio app. Then search WNOV 860, save it to your favorites, and you can have access to our radio show live wherever you're at in the world. Our radio program will also have podcast replay under the radio tab day, uh, several days following the live broadcast. You can find all of these links in the show notes below. Our show airs 9 to 10 a.m. Central Standard Time every Saturday, March through the end of October. And we want to thank our sponsors because without them, this would not be anywhere possible. You can find all of their links under the radio tab on our website at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com. For more information, please visit thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.